to Safety Podcast, another episode. You have me as your host, Apollonia Rockwell. And today I am so excited that I have somebody that I have never met before, but by reading her bio, by reading um, everything about this gal has really inspired me. Today we have Rosa Creo, and Rosa is an author of a recently released book, called The Relationship Factor in Safety Leadership. And Rosa, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, great. Thank you. It's a beautiful day in Long Beach, California. Oh my gosh, I'm so jealous. We're in Colorado and I bet you it's uh, five degrees. It's Ooh. been it's been so cold this week. What is the temperature? What is the, what does the weather look like well, for you? Right now it's in the low 60s. Uh, yeah, it just went through a heat wave of 90 degrees. So it, it oh just swings That's... back and forth. I'm so jealous. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, um, I'm super excited, Rosa, to talk with you again. You've just been so inspiring. Um, just I feel like we have a lot of mutual beliefs when it comes to safety and how to motivate and inspire and impact people. And there's a certain way to do that. Can you take our listeners from the beginning and just tell us how in the world did you get into safety? How did you, how did you get to writing this book? How did you get into the industry? Just, I guess, start from the beginning. All righty. Well, first I should say that it took me 25 years to write the book. Okay. <laughs> a lot of good experience in this book then. That, that's that's a good thing. Of good experience. Of, of course, I've uh, written many things before that in terms of articles and book chapters. But it um, took me a long time to get up the courage to publish mm. because I was always so concerned about, well, uh, you know, what am I saying that's going to help people? Uh, yeah. What? What do I really know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one day I just finally said, uh, no, nope, I'm going to get the word out because I've met enough um, fantastic leaders and talked to thousands of employees and hundreds of supervisors and managers out in the field when I was out there interviewing them and doing the safety culture assessments to have, mm-hmm. I feel I know I have a really good grasp of what people are thinking and doing, what works and what doesn't work. I think that you can help a lot of our listeners today. Um, If you are starting in the safety industry, if you're experienced and maybe you're experiencing um, some burnout just in your profession, I think that it's it's our goal as a, as safety professionals to bring workers home safely, to make an impact about the business that we're working with or working at. And safety culture is top of mind for all of us. And so can you help us understand what you learned during your experiences of interviewing people within the company, within these companies, in the trenches, boots on the ground? What did you learn about safety culture and how that's created? Yeah, well, great question. Ah, where should I start? I'm sure that's a, that is the, that's a loaded question. So you start wherever you want to. Okay, so I, I've been on a journey pretty, that pretty much reflects the journey of safety management. In, in okay. total, because when I was younger, I was I, I worked for a premium and gifts company, and a major part of our business was developing safety awards um, for you know accident free days, uh, you know performance above uh, above average, hmm. and it was a very lucrative business uh, because it seemed that when people were giving incentives. They, they were getting much better results, fewer and fewer accidents. Okay. Then one, then one day okay. I'm out talking to the people and they said, oh, that, was, that, that, that last program was absolutely ridiculous. Um, they, mm. uh, they offered a truck to, uh, for a drawing for anyone who had gone 360 days without a lost time injury. I know where this is going. Oh, my goodness. You know the story. So the person that won it 
was uh, he said, that's a someone who never follows the same rules and never reports anything. Of course. So, of course, everybody <sighs> took note of how you win a beautiful truck. Truck? <laughs> <laughs> the culture was sit in people were learning from experience at the company. And so that's what they were seeing mm -hmm. that this is how you are rewarded in this company. If you yes. shut your mouth, if you, if you have an accident, you take care of it on your own time. I mean, without saying it, that's just how the culture was set. Am I right? I mean, that's yeah, just, right. and, and the other part is take risks. Oh take risks, yeah. Job done quickly and on time. We yeah. really like people who, um, you know, improvise and get things done. Yeah. So that was uh, the 80s, uh, mid 80s, early 80s. Okay. And so uh, everything I've learned at Polonia, I, I've learned from the people on the ground. Yes. Uh, yes. Everything. Uh, yeah. I, I was, um, later on, I went back to get my master's in organizational development and I I began to read the great books from people who had been trying to tell business leaders for decades that um, the hu about the human side of the organization. And one of the famous one, uh, ones was uh, the Theory X and Theory Y, hmm. uh, which most people uh, are familiar with. But the uh, manager X was the manager who... Uh, use control and command. Okay. And the theory Y manager was the one who believed that people were uh, willing to contribute their, their best selves if they were treated properly, and motivated properly. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that was uh, McGregor back in, again, uh, late 50s, early 60s. Mm. And here we are today reinventing the wheel. Because when there's <laughs> yeah. basically a repetition uh, yeah. with a lot of great examples. Uh, I think that it is worth reading because it's filled with case studies and really practical applications of just how um, you need to treat employees for them to feel that you value them, that you appreciate them, that you mm -hmm. want them to speak up, that you want them to come forward. And it has nothing to do with money and prizes. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, yeah. In fact, the uh, a recent study showed that uh, money and compensation was number sixteen on the list of motivations in a survey of about twenty thousand employees. That is so interesting and so helpful for for small business leaders or people that are working in small businesses. That's good for us to hear because I often struggle and think how. How can we, you know, how can we do more? How can we beat more? If we have clients that come to us and say, how can we recognize our top employees that are doing the right thing? They're taking leadership when it comes to safety, when it comes to um, taking a stance for doing the right thing. And, and often companies will come to us and say, we don't have the budget for it. We're screwed. And that's not the case. What you're, you're saying, the data shows you don't always have to recognize with trucks and and, re and fancy bonuses. Um, great appreciation can also come from genuine acknowledgement from your supervisor. Is that right? Well, let me be direct that prizes uh, do not help. Yeah. Because that, yeah. that really isn't what motivates us as human beings. So let me go back on some of the principles that I've learned and I cover in my book. Uh, yes. about yes. Uh, what motivates people and what I've seen through examples in the workplace. Um, in Maslow's hierarchy, uh, uh, who's been very influential in the whole uh, premium and rewards industry, he mm -hmm. talked about the fact that uh, people have to have uh, food and clothing and shelter, and they have to have a sense of security in order to function and, and, and just be basic workers, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you do have to have a living wage. I mean, if you're paying people $2 an hour, you're, you're, you're not going to get good results. You have to have a living wage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then after that, he said that was when um, recognition 
uh, kicked in, that people then had a little bit extra to worry about self-esteem. Okay. And then a sense of belong. Do I belong here or not? Okay. Uh, it turns out that having the, f- the feeling that you belong, that you're part of a team, you're part of the tribe, you're respected, you're appreciated, mm. you're included, motivates us in almost every action and decision we make. Because if, even if it's just an instant, we flash back to, well, what, what will so-and-so think? Uh, what, what's going to be the consequence of this to my status on the group? Will I lose credibility? And believe mm-hmm. it or not, that's why people don't ask questions. And that leads to accidents because they did not want to lose credibility mm. with their peers or with the supervisor. Mm. I don't want to. I... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That makes so much sense. I mean, thinking back on all the incident investigations that I've done. I mean, going back to the deepest root of these incidents, not, I can't even say, I don't even think one time did an employee tell me that they, that this was a true accident. They have a freak accident. They have no idea how this happened. What is, what's mostly the case are employees that said, I knew it. I knew what I was doing was wrong, Apollonia. I knew. I knew what I was doing was wrong. I was rushing and I took the risk. And I, just like you said, I didn't want to ask questions. I was afraid to raise my hand. I was afraid to uh, say, I was afraid to cause disruption in production. And I just wanted to go with the flow. And that's what caused this incident. I mean, I think that people are so, I love how you're talking about people having a need of belonging because we're all humans. It doesn't matter if you're working in oil and gas or construction or the office, whatever it is, us humans all have this sense of belonging and uh, be a part of something bigger, a tribe. And so we will do what it takes to fit in oftentimes. And that's just good awareness for us as safety professionals or leaders, because we need to recognize that. And we need to make sure that people are rewarded and recognized for doing the right thing. Um, something that I really believe in that I'd love to get your input on is I, I believe that there's not so much a safety culture. I know we say safety culture a lot and I, and I'm, constantly catch myself saying safety culture a lot too. But after your experience and you or um, doing research and interviewing with companies, would you say that it's not so much a safety culture? It's more of just a company culture, whatever this company culture allows you to do, you'll do. There's, I just feel like there's not an operations culture, an accounting culture, a safety culture. It's just the company culture. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is uh, are you. I uh, you are all completely on the right track because mm. uh, you know the way people work in safety in terms of following rules or taking risks uh, isn't just because they're working in, with safety or because they're working in operations. It, it's because yeah. that is a pressure and of the uh, that that leadership puts on people and the expectations, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if I uh, put, if I'm always um, praising people who meet deadlines or brought in the most money uh, uh, or did the job the fastest, mm-hmm. I am, I am creating the culture because yeah. people want to belong. So, uh, and I love the word tribe, right? I and love that I, too. I love how you said that. You can't be a member of the tribe if you don't go along uh, with what the tribe does or, or thinks is important or, or you know, th- that set of values that the tribe has. Yeah, yeah. I think that's key for, I mean, that's a good take home. That's some take home reflection that all of our listeners can do right now is the company that you're working with, the company that you are consulting with, whatever it may be, 
what is the company culture and what are the tribe's unsaid expectations? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think you have unsaid expectations, think twice, you do. Mm -hmm. What does your company reward for? What do they discipline for? Mm -hmm. Um, That's something to take a look at right now. So I don't want to get off track. So continue on with some more of the the ahas and the learning lessons that you, that you learned from working with these companies. So one, you're saying that people want to, want to belong. They have a need to belong. And, um, and what else? Yes. Well, then, um, came the kicker really, uh, because, uh, neuroscience began to come up with some amazing research about how the brain operates uh, because they're able to do the MRIs and really look into what uh, what parts of the brain are operating under different circumstances. Mm, okay. A brilliant researcher that uh, would show people, uh, they were under the MRI machine and then they would, they were shown photos of uh, violence. Hmm. Uh, physical violence, mm-hmm. and then they were shown um, f- uh, photos of verbal abuse, uh, and they were shown uh, photos that obviously depicted someone that was an outsider or an outcast, such as one famous one is there's there's a little child sitting on the bench that didn't get chosen for the baseball team. We, yeah. And our hearts always go, oh. Yeah. That, I'm like, I'm like, that was me. That, yeah. that was me. <laughs> so uh, here's the interesting thing is that they discovered that all of these things lit up the same part of the brain. Oh my so God. The, the brain was inter- interpreting a, a threat of physical violence, verbal abuse, or ostracism in the same way. Oh in the same God. way. Uh, and so, how do I mean, one interpretation of their mind, mind was, and a lot of people, was that exclusion, ostracism, rejection is a, is a uh, psychological injury that can be more serious than a physical injury. This is mind blowing. If I had, um, if I had some music over here, I would drop a bomb. (laughs) That is a huge learning lesson, Rosa, because for our listeners, I have never heard anyone on the show or even the podcast that I listen to or the books that I read. I have never heard it said the way that you just spelled it out there, that our brains are seeing and feel threats of violence, verbal abuse, all that as just as equal, just as on the same playing field as exclusion. And what does that say for us as safety professionals? I mean, that is, that's huge. Because what that says to me is that people will do anything. If you're, let's say you're a new guy or girl on the crew, you're working in oil and gas or construction or whatever industry it is. And and gosh forbid that you're newer and you see that people are, you know, doing something the wrong way. You will not, There, the chances are that you are not likely to speak up because you're just trying so hard to fit in with this new company, right? Yes. Wow. And if you've ever had the experience of speaking up without even knowing that you were speaking up, right? Mm-hmm. You're just, you're new and you do something or say something because you know it's right. Then, and suddenly you find yourself an outsider. Yeah. I had yeah. a boss that happened to me with one of my bosses. I, um, I, I was uh, doing a project for a higher level manager and she asked me to stop working on it. So because he had called me and spoken to me personally, I told him that I was no longer going to work on the project. And he called my boss and reamed her out because oh. <laughs> she had made that decision. Well, I can tell you that uh, I was no longer uh, a desirable on, on her team and was wow. thereafter excluded from all information and meetings and everything. Uh, 
I just left because mm. uh, I and, and learned a lesson because I, you know, you uh, and unfortunately, we learn these lessons the hard way, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just go walking in and speak up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yet, what do we always tell people? You Stop have, work. You have the obligation to speak up. If yep. you had speaking up, spoken up, this accident wouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. Why won't nurses tell doctors when they're about to uh, take off the wrong leg? <laughs> why? Mm. Why won't nurses tell doctors about uh, medication mistakes? And, and they're all over in the research in the reviews that uh, no, I can't because I've seen other people the retaliation against other nurses that spoke up, and I'm not going to take that chance. You know, it's my mind went there immediately when you when you were explaining this story is that how many times as safety professionals have we chanted and ranted stop work stop work stop work authority it's it, it, exactly what you said it's an obligation it's not your responsibility it's your obligation to stop work if you see something that's unsafe but we really need to take a step back and and see how we can make it more, more comfortable, how we can make the culture more comfortable, more rewarding to speak up and just really focus on that culture piece because it's easier said than done. And the research is showing that is what you're explaining. And, um, wow, that's incredible. Okay. The research is showing that in our experience. I mean, uh, we get kind of brainwashed, right? Yeah. (laughs) Because we were told, all the time, uh, you know, zero incidents, 100% compliance, uh, if, you know, get people to speak up because they're a really important part of the, uh, of the safety culture, right? And yeah. that is true. That is all true. However, in our guts, when we see that it's not happening, we yeah. need to start considering other approaches and not yeah. necessarily just follow blindly. And here I'm going to say something that may be uh, a bit difficult, but I feel that this information about how the brain reacts to threat is a great opening for safety professionals. I agree. Because we can go in and build relationships with employees, uh, earn their trust, and save more lives. Yeah. Yes. I think it is all connected. I, I, I absolutely believe that this is all connected. And I think that the greatest way for us to make an impact at a, at a business, small business, large business, medium size is to start with relationships and is to not take the safety cop approach. I've never found that that has worked anywhere. But to really, really take the time to understand the stories of the men and women that are boots on the ground, who are actually doing the work and and really understanding what motivates them. What do they care about? And showing that you're deeply invested in their success. I've seen the best returns and I've seen the guards go down and the walls go down. Um when I can show an employee that I really care for him or her. Um, Is there anything else that really, that was another big takeaway when doing your research or um, researching with these companies? Yes. Uh, Something that struck me was that uh, the very uh, successful safety professionals and, and managers and when I say successful, I'm talking about uh, getting, uh, you know, good, you know, very, you know, excellent safety uh, results, uh, good production, good, uh, you know, on-time delivery and all of those things. They, they all had, see, because there's really no difference between an excellent safety record and an excellent on-time record. Mm, right right (laughs) they go they have to go together and what about quality right there's Mm -hmm. really no difference between high quality and and excellence and safety yes yep yeah right so 
I, what I noticed was that even in the most dysfunctional organizations, and I've been in some big, big companies with some big, big problems, lots of accidents, I would find pockets of successful teams. Okay. Yeah, and I have been lucky enough to actually be able to interview these people and talk to them. And they really all shared uh, a philosophy about expecting the best from people and spending time talking to each of them. That was a huge aha about the power of conversation. Wow. Wow. Just that the, the communication Yes. Was free going. Is that what you're saying between a yes. uh, direct supervisor and the crew that there was a lot of communication? Yeah, but when we use the word communication, it can be misleading because oftentimes, here's a good one uh, we changed the policy on time off. Well, I never knew that. Well, that's because you didn't read the bulletin board. <laughs> oh, you didn't notice the one of a thousand pieces of paper that were up on the bulletin board and that's your fault because you didn't read it. Exactly. I see. So HR is really happy because they communicated. Quote, unquote. <laughs> uh, no, information is not communication. Yes. It, uh, communication is conversation understood. So you and I are talking right now, we're having a conversation, you're putting in ideas and I'm putting out ideas. But if we leave this conversation with a different understanding of what we each said, it has not really been a communication. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And you could think that as a supervisor, as a leader, you could think that your message is being communicated because you said it once, because you said it twice, because you said it three times. But I like how you said conversation understood between all parties. And that's when communication happens. So you would find these. So how did that work? So within organizations that didn't have the best safety records, you said that there were pockets of successful teams. Yes. And these teams expected the best from each other. The, and well, it starts with the leader. The leader, it's really the leader that, that sets. And now everybody's talking about psychological safety, which is a great term, because essentially what the leader is doing is creating a safe space. Yeah. By, yeah. And he does it by communicating and, and having a conversation with each person, getting to know them, finding out what they want, what they need, and supplying those things. Because mm -hmm. the, what's going to motivate you, Apollonia, is going to be different than what motivates me. Absolutely. But if our manager doesn't talk to us, uh, he or she's not going to know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a key takeaway that we can all, doesn't matter what position you're in at the company, we can all take back and, and really think, how, how are we communicating with the people we work around every day? Is it sparse? Is it um, high level, very, um, how's the weather type of conversations? Or are you getting deep with the people that you're working around? And I, and I hear what you're saying that that will make all the difference. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting down, how are you? But the thing is that if you ask somebody, how are you? Then take the time to stop and listen. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually listening and, and get more than just a, I'm good. Cause I think we're all wired to say that, right? Oh, I'm please. good. How are you? Mm -hmm. And you know, most times we're not good <laughs> or most times there's not that we're not good, but maybe there's a lot going on. Um, everyone is carrying some sort of burden yes. and is going through some sort of challenges that we often don't, we don't always know about. Um, so I think yeah. that that's amazing and that's beautiful to, to take the time and have developed deep relationships, have deep conversations with the people we're working around to, to create safe spaces. I like that. Um, anything else? What well, about, and it's, it may seem a lot of supervisors when I tell them about this, they, they don't have time. I, I, I'm just too busy to have conversations. They, they like to call it chit chat, you know, and fluffy yeah. stuff. 
I, I just don't have the time. Uh, and I can understand that they're, they're buried in, in administrative work. And that's, that goes, you know, up the chain, up the chain to top management. That's something they have got to address sooner, sooner than later. Uh-huh. Uh, but the other thing is that um, there's an insecurity about uh, just going through and getting to know people and letting them get to know you. Mm. Um, yeah. And this is a very human as well, because another thing that came up in my research was that um, the way uh, with human beings, every social interaction, every time we interact with another human being, Mm -hmm. uh, the brain unconsciously feels it's taking a risk. Going, going, wow. going back to the need to belong, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to go out and talk to you. And I don't know if you've ever had a, uh, this experience that I've had, is that I will say something or make a remark that I consider perfectly valid or innocent. And later on, I'll find out that somebody was very upset or angry about it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, of course, my immediate reaction is, oh, you know, that'll teach me to say anything. (laughs) Yeah, yes, yes. Right? I have been in those situations and um, I can relate to what you're talking about as far as um, maybe the brain kind of seeing new interactions as a risk, so to say, because when I was a new leader And I didn't have, like most of us, we don't have leadership training when you're put in a management role, not all the time. Mm -hmm. And starting out in my career, I, I was really, really afraid of letting people get to know me Mm -hmm. because I was new. I was really young for the industry that I was in. I was the youngest one at the company and I just thought that I had to put on this brave professional persona on Mm -hmm. and I couldn't let anybody know anything about my personal life. And, and that I realized was not going to be effective because I couldn't build these really strong relationships with people Mm -hmm. when I wouldn't let anybody in, but I was self-conscious that I was a new, I was new and I was young and a girl working in oil and gas. So I was just, I was just afraid. And you were probably right to be afraid (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was, that was real. Yeah. I really was afraid. I really, I was like, they're not going to respect me. How am I going to right. push safety when I haven't walked a mile in yeah. their shoes? Yeah. And yeah. so I was just mm-hmm. so closed off and I learned quick that I needed to change up my strategy because that was not working. Was it, was there a moment when that changed for you? Do you recall? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my, my boss was really hard on me. I started, I was in college and I was working for this oil and gas company and he just told me I needed to figure it the F out. Like he just said, you need to, I said, what am I supposed to do? I got the safety position. He's like, you need to figure it the F out. And so through trial and error, it one day did hit me that because I was going out in the field (laughs) with, you know, my hard hat and my boots and my glasses. And I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm trying so hard to fit in. And then I realized Apollonia, you will never be the most experienced welder here at this company. Like you could spend all your time in the welding shop. You're not going to be one of the welders. You're never going to have all the trucking experience like some of these drivers do. You're never going to have the roustabout experience like these field hands do. But it, so what, what does that leave me with? Mm-hmm. Okay. What I can do is I can start building authentic relationships. Mm-hmm. And even though I'll never be the most experienced person in the room, What I can do is I can pull off of their experience and instead of talking about lockout, tag out, like I'm the expert, I can pull from our drivers and from the welders and from the crews, hey, what what challenges, I I, I would break everybody into groups. And then I just came up with these questions Mm -hmm. and every question was a discussion question. What lockout, tag out issues have you had in the past? 
what challenges have you had? Have you ever had an incident revolving around lockout tagout? And then I would make each group. And, and then how did you prevent that from happening moving forward? What would you do different? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then these groups, I would make them present and they were the subject matter experts they are. teaching each other in the group yeah. because I was never going to have that experience and that's okay. But as long as I pulled and leaned on the boots on the ground and made them the subject matter experts because they are, I learned from them. And once we had that dynamic and that relationship that I'm here to take care of them, I'm here to, um, you know, if they needed something, I was there to get what they needed, push it up management. And then I was able to teach the OSHA regulations because that's what I, that was my expertise. Mm -hmm. And I was able to have this partnership in that way, but it didn't work. Safety cop doesn't work. No, um, no, wow, that's that's amazing. But let me ask you this: How did you know to do that? I think it just one day. Honestly, one one memory, one vivid memory that I have: I was in the welding shop, and I had been asking the guys, "Wear your face shield. Wear your face shield." I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Then one day, I just kind of gravitate gravitated towards the leader of the shop. You know which one I'm talking about? The one that's the the unsaid leader. He's mm-hmm. like the man in charge, but he doesn't mm-hmm. have the title. But it's the it's the guy everyone respects. He was like the the bad. Every, you know, everyone loved him. Mm-hmm. So I went up to one of these guys and I just said, "Blank," you know his name. Mm-hmm. Um, I need your help. And and so instead of approaching it like I need you to wear your face shield, I said, "Hey, man." I need some help. How do I get these guys to wear their face shields? And he was like, Apollonia, these face shields suck and the goggles suck. They fog up every time you are in this angle. He's like, at my last employer, we wore this brand. He's like, if you got, if you got me this brand, if you pushed it up, pushed it up to management and got me this face shield, Mm -hmm. then, um, oh, you know, I'll make sure everyone wears it. So sure enough, I bought the brand he wanted. And that guy implemented everything I was trying to push and he implemented it in a minute because it was his idea. It was his feedback. Mm -hmm. So he owned it and he made sure all the guys wore their face shields when I wasn't at the shop and there, and then that then reduced the, the, uh, the eye incidents that we had. So I realized if I just leaned in and had that approach versus a mandating approach, then I was going to be more successful. So what you're illustrating is that we learn some of our best uh, lessons when we're pushed to the wall. Yeah. And we ask for help. So you were an exception in that. In my experience, you were an exception. But that is consistently what people have shared with me. Wow. I, I was going to share a story with you, but I, it was exactly the same story of a young safety professional who came into nuclear, knew absolutely nothing, but his father had told him uh, when he was growing up, his father uh, was a, um, a mechanic, uh, one of the maintenance people in nuclear, uh, at the nuclear plant and told him how much he hated the safety engineers because they were always coming in to tell him how to do his job. Yes, yes. And so the, the this person had gone in and his very first day after he graduated from college, he said, I don't know anything about how things work here. Please teach me. And he became one of the most successful. He was uh, promoted to supervisor and manager. And he was one of he's one of the success stories in, in my book. Because he came in exactly what you're talking about, Apollonia. Uh, mm-hmm. Ask for help. The the book Humble Inquiry by mm-hmm. Ed Shine. Mm-hmm. Have you read that? No, I haven't. Okay. But I feel like I've heard of I've heard of yeah, it from well, one of my mentors. Of and because it's exactly the same advice. If yeah. you come in as the expert, you fail. If you yeah. come in as uh, with humility and yep. learn what people are trying to do, what What are some of the things that they're struggling with, uh, they will tell you. And then mm-hmm. here's the part where it'll either make you or break you. If you do not follow up, yeah, then you will not have, have a second chance to establish that trust. 
Yes. Yes. I agree with you. I think that looking back on my career in safety, I realized that you're exactly right. I was starting to build momentum with the team. We were starting to have more effective safety meetings. We were having more effective safety audits where I wasn't there to audit them. I was there to ask questions and to be there for support and help and, and, and had that, that approach versus I'm just auditing you. And so, um, I realized that then the follow-up came through. I would do what I said I was going to do. I bought, I, you know, I pushed for the changes that the boots on the ground wanted. And once I, all those little small wins started stacking up, then my reputation and my credibility and my relationship got stronger with the field because they knew that I was for them and not against them. And so, wow. Oh my gosh. Well, Rosa, I'm looking at the time oh my gosh. and I have gone over my time with you. So I'm so sorry that I'm rambling, t- t- talking so much, talking your ear off, but, um, I would love to do a part two with you because I feel like I have just scratched the surface. I feel like I can talk to you all day and I, uh, I have so much more that I would love to ask you about. Well, that, would be, that would be great. And I think it's so important that you did share your story because you're you're the one out there. Uh, you have that on the boots, boots on the <laughs> ground experience yourself, you know, in a different way. But you do. And I think when uh, other especially people that are in university thinking about coming into this profession, they, they need to hear from people that are closer to their age, closer to their experience so that they can be ready when they get there. Because right now they're woefully unprepared for what awaits them. Absolutely. Listeners, guys, I'm, I'm going to be uh, re-listening to this podcast just to listen to you, Rosa. I know people are jotting notes listening to this, but some of the key takeaways, I mean, so far right now, are a few things. One, take a look at your organization and understand that everyone has a sense of belonging. And, and that's something that we should all be reflecting on after we're finished listening to this is now that we know that people have a sense of belonging, that people want to fit in, what can we do differently? How are we rewarding and recognizing team members for doing the right thing, for standing up, not not having zero accidents, but for turning in their near misses, for um, bringing up suggestions on how we can correct things, do things better. How are those actions rewarded at your company? That was great feedback. Also, so a great takeaway from you today is our brains recognize threats such as um, violence, verbal abuse, this, the same exact way as we do exclusion. Mm -hmm. And so if we, now that we know that we really have to make sure that somebody who brings up a safety infraction, somebody that, uh, stops the job, how are we treating that individual? Really, really be conscious of that. And then, um, um, expecting the best out of your team. And it goes both ways. Leaders to the field and field to your leaders is expecting the best. It starts with leadership, um, develop great, deep, uh, relationships and have deep conversations and real conversations with the people that you work around. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I've noted that you've said, Rosa, is to create a safe space for your team Mm -hmm. and creating a mental and emotional safe space for your team is going to allow the feedback that you've been hoping for as a safety leader. You're going to get people that will raise their hands, stop the job, um, do the right thing when no one's looking. So, oh my gosh, this has been Rosa. I'm telling, this has been one of my favorite conversations on the podcast. I need um, to say that to everyone. No, you have to look back. You have to look back and listen because it's not, I don't say that. I just, yeah. um, you have a beautiful mind and a beautiful way that you look at safety and it's, it's really inspiring. Well, thank um, you. And uh, you have an amazing mind. Uh, you, you've captured the main ideas and you're ready to become an author. Oh my gosh. Maybe you and I can co-write something. (laughs) 
<laughs> we could put, and I see too, this is why I want to do a part two, because I see, um, I know that you have oil and gas experience, yes. um, amongst many other industries that you've worked with. And I think the biggest, um, challenge that people write in about, or they ask me questions about is how do I make an impact with the culture at my company? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I feel like you're an expert at that. So I would love to do a part two with you. Sure. And we can talk specifically because it is, it is all about the relationships and the relationships build the culture. Hmm. Yeah. That's all. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for listening, uh, everyone. And thank you, Rosa, for being a guest here today. Guys, we will link up Rosa's contact information, her bio, how you can get a hold of her, a link to her book. We will, um, that will all be listed in the podcast description. Thank you so much for listening. And Rosa, thank you so much for being here. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.